What's up, my friend? I'm health expert Ted Rice, and today I'm coming to you from Bangkok, Thailand. Did a hard Muay Thai training today, kicking pads, kneeing heavy bags, and just having a great time learning how to knee, elbow, kick, and punch people. Uh, <laughs> so... I'm really excited to share this episode with you today because it's part two of Alan Aragon. And if you're training hard like I am, you need to know the best nutrition information so that you can support your hard training, you can support your health. Now, if this is your first time listening to the show, you want to go back and listen to part one of Alan Aragon. But in general, this show is about health and fitness information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a longer, healthier life. Now, before we get to part two, I just want to say this very quickly. If you've been listening to the Legendary Life podcast for a while, you know that my Legendary Life program 2020 has just opened. That's my coaching group. Actually, I have one-on-one and group coaching. If you've been listening for a while and you're like, man, I really want to do that, but it's just not the right time, but now you feel like it's the right time, and you know the type of results you get, or you get, people get when they join my program because you've heard all the testimonials, you've listened to me for a while, then what I want you to do is go to legendarylifeprogram.com slash apply to book your free breakthrough call. Now, if you're new to the show or you're on the fence, you haven't been listening that long, the best place to go to learn more about what I do and see the type of results I get is to watch our free masterclass. There's one for women, and one for men, and it's brand new. Go to legendarylightpodcast.com slash free, and you can watch it there. Let's get to part two with Alan Aragon. So about the energy balance thing, we've talked mm-hmm. about it. I've talked about calorie deficit. You've talked about energy in, ener- energy out, and, and how this balance can change without us even realizing it, especially in conditions like severe hypothyroidism where their metabolic rate is lower because thyroid hormone directly affects metabolic rate. But just as important is not that your metabolism is slower, but you also feel sluggish. So you don't realize it, but you're just laying around more than you think. And if you're not tracking that somehow, you're going to feel like, well, I don't, you know, I'm up. I do things. I go to the gym three times a week for an hour, but you don't realize that all those hours that you're not doing things because you're so fatigued are playing a huge role. And so the energy balance thing, it's something that, you know, guys like Gary Tobbs and uh, others have kind of like thrown under, right? The calorie myth and calories, <laughs> bad, cal- good calories, bad calories. But the way I explain it is like this, and I'm, I'm curious to if you have anything to add to it, but the first law of thermodynamics, when you start talking about it, it's like, well, energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. Sounds really like, oh, well, that sounds science-y and, and kind of hard to explain, but it's like this. If you're building a house, you need the building, you need the concrete blocks to build it. And you can't build fat out of nothing. It's like, here, I'm building a house because of the environment, right? Which is essentially what people are talking about with insulin. And it's like, no, the building blocks need to be there. You cannot build muscle and you cannot store fat uh, without the building blocks. And what are the building blocks? It's the food you eat. And you can't, you know, if you're not moving enough too. I mean, if you're moving too much, you can't even store the fat because you end up burning it. And we're in this sort of state in modern society, especially in America, where we just, we don't get this because our society is so much different. But I've been in Asia for two years and it's really clear the cultural differences. And it's not that, I've been to Hong Kong, by the way, which has the longest life span. It's not talked about that much as a blue zone because it's not a country, it's a city, but they have the longest uh, lifespan now that passed Okinawa, Japan. And I've been there. They're eating a shit ton of white rice 
and macaroni. They've got this weird, when you go to Hong Kong, I know you're going to be in Hong Kong. Make sure you stop off at one of those weird Hong Kong restaurants where they serve like, <laughs> you know, this Chinese style pork soup, but it's got like Western macaroni and it. it's the strangest sort of <laughs> stuff they have in Hong Kong. But you'll see people, there's nowhere to sit down. People have very small homes, really small homes, and they're out all the time walking around. And just in Asia in general, at least in the parts that I've been, there's a culture where unlike Americans who go home after work, sit on the couch, be with their family, there's a culture here where people go out and they're around other people, even if they're not talking and like, oh, hey, what's going on? Or, uh, you know, they're out, they're walking around. And it hap- it's everywhere that I've been to. There's just this culture, a food culture, going out to eat. Very few people cook. And people are looking for what's the secret. Even I think Dan Bootner with his Blue Zones book kind of um, didn't put enough emphasis on this part where these people are just moving all the time. They're just walking yeah, around yeah. all the time. And yeah, Dan eating. Bootner definitely seems like, I mean, gosh, if you left him to to... To his own devices, he he'd probably look like the guy, one of the guys that J.P. Sears makes fun of, you know, like like the uh, uh, ultra spiritual life or something like that. I forgot the name of his uh yeah his his, his deal ultra but spiritual. I think it's J.P. Yeah. Is it J J.P. Sears? Is that yeah? It? That's him. Yeah, he's super yeah. funny, man. I was surprised that Dan Buettner didn't look exactly like like that because <laughs> <laughs> he just. Yeah, he he does ignore a lot of the stuff, and he does lean on uh, a lot of the emphasis of uh, you know very little animal protein and all 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 of that jazz, and um, and especially the emphasis on nutrition too, right? Mm -hmm. They're really emphasizing nutrition. It's like, well, what about movement? What about the other things? You know? Oh yeah, yeah. That that's not talked about a whole lot, and I, I think you do bring up a a great point about just the culture of not going home and Netflix and chilling. It's just not like that in Asia, right? And it is going to be very interesting when I see that, because I do plan on visiting Asia next year for a couple of speaking gigs. So it, it, it's going to be cool. I'm probably just going to see the, you know, the hotel and the conference room life. And, but, you know, go out um, to eat, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for, what the culture is about uh, in terms of just just movement and stuff, you know, I'm ready to be walking the streets with a bowl of macaroni. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I can't wait to to hear your experience about that. But, um, you know, to bring it back for people, you know, just understanding like this energy balance thing and metabolism, what would you, how would you even describe metabolism to someone who, I mean, you, you hear people say, well, I have a slow metabolism and then you're like, okay, cool. What, what is a metabolism? And I don't mean, you know, the complicated bio, all the biochemistry, but just like, what are the different factors that really matter when it comes to specifically fat loss? Could you, how would you explain that to someone? Well, doing my best to keep it simple There are, you can look at metabolism, somebody's metabolism as the sum total of their energy intake and energy output, you know, just the sum balance of that. Um, Metabolism can be defined in in different ways, but we're we're talking basically about energetics, total net energetics of, of, of metabolism. And so on the energy inside of the equation, There's the foods that you eat and how much you eat of them and what those foods are composed of, especially with with, with a specific relevance to this topic, how energy dense are those foods and and how much calories in do you take? So so calories in as a concept is easier to explain. It's what you eat and drink. That's calories in. So calories out is the part that people tend to forget about the different components of. So uh, calories out is your resting energy expenditure and your non-resting energy expenditure. So your resting energy expenditure or the amount of calories that you burn on a constant, on a 24-hour basis, whether you're moving or not, just to keep you alive, just to keep your vital processes alive, 
that for most people on the planet who aren't doing triathlons, <laughs> that is the major part of their calories burned. That's 60 to 70% of their daily calories burned is their resting energy expenditure or also called resting metabolic rate. Um, also interchange with, with calling it basal metabolic rate. They're all essentially the same thing. Um, so that's 60, 60 to 70% of your, of your calories out is resting energy expenditure. Now, non-resting energy expenditure is the little tricky one. Okay, that's the tricky one. That is composed of your exercise activity as well as your non-exercise activity. So everybody's got a handle basically on their exercise activity. They yeah, know do whether you work they, out or not, right? Right, right. And how often do you work out? Oh, you go to the gym, you know, you're, you're a bro. Okay, cool. You hit the gym four times a week, about an hour for, you know, for <laughs> biceps and pecs. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You, everybody's got a handle on energy out. Oh, how much cardio you do? Oh, you do like 30 minutes on a treadmill at this intensity, uh, you know, three, di- three days a week. Okay, great. But it's the non-exercise activity. That is kind of the X factor with people who are either succeeding at their programs or are very frustrated with their programs because non-exercise activity has the widest potential for variability between individuals. Um, And most individuals don't know it. They don't even, they're not even aware of it. Um, I'm talking like on the low end, non-exercise activity can comprise maybe 10% of your total calories burned in the day. And then on the higher end, your non-exercise activity, if you're looking at a highly active work occupation with a bunch of uh, just natural hyperkineticness of youth, for example, then that can be up to 50% or more of your total energies burned through the day that it can be like right up close to what your resting metabolic rate is. And so you have a spectrum of people who are highly sedentary where their job consists of just at most you're, you're tapping your fingers on a keyboard and then you're maybe swiveling your chair around to hurl an insult or a compliment to your, (laughs) to your coworkers um, and then swivel back and then you're plinking your fingers again. And then you go home and what do you do? You sit the heck down, eat something. And then after you're done eating, you go sit at the computer or, sit sit in front of your 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 65 inch plasma screen if it's you ted <laughs> so um <laughs> and so you know you've got that low end of the spectrum and then you've got people like my wife who won't sit down from the minute she gets up to the minute she goes to sleep she will not sit down she's just not i don't know it must be a korean thing or something <laughs> um, and, and of course you have extremes like people who do manual labor, uh, um, and then you have a little bit less extremes where people have physically active jobs where they're on their feet, like servers at a restaurant, um, like, like people who do, um, custodial work or oh gosh, even certain personal trainers who have a lot of clients and they're hustling and they're handing people weights and they're counting reps. And then, you know, there's a spectrum of non-exercise physical activity and when people are aware of where they stand on that spectrum it's illuminating to realize that between two people of the exact same size and same body composition depending on their non-exercise physical activity they can differ from like it's really common for people to differ like 500 to a thousand calories huge their non-exercise activity yeah very common for that man and so when people don't have a handle on that part of energy out, that's when they get confused and that's when they get frustrated. Um, and of course, you know, the energy in part, people mess up on that as well. I'm, I'm not going to downplay how much people mess up on the energy in part. And satiety is a huge thing. People have to find their own group with satiety. And, and as you mentioned, it isn't about some magic hormones like insulin and, and, and all that silliness that all these uh, – utterly silly gurus put out in in the Twitter space and the Instagram and Facebook space. It's not about insulin. It, 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 satiety definitely matters. And when people increase their protein intake and or reduce their carbohydrate intake, um, that's going to affect satiety. 
So when satiety is increased, people eat less. It's not about insulin. <laughs> right. So yeah, and and uh, and and interesting. There there is a body of uh, a small body of research showing that ketogenic dieting can increase satiety independent of of, of everything and independent of of protein intake. You can match protein intake between two diets and make one diet ketogenic, and the ketogenic diet will tend to have a greater satiating effect than the non-ketogenic diet, which is kind of an inconvenient truth for people who just hate keto. But the big question that you have to throw into that conversation is, okay, for how long does this greater satiating effect last? Right. How sustainable is that? And, and does it even last for more than a month or two that we've studied the subjects? And when you look at things anecdotally, when you think of your friends and colleagues who have tried keto, you gather, gather up a room of them. Gather up like, let's say you don't have many friends. Let's say you can only gather up 10 people you know who tried keto. You could pretty much bet your, your rear end that only a few of them actually stayed on keto. Right. <laughs> if it was this magical thing that's just so darn doable and so simple, then everybody who's dying to lose weight and improve whatever clinical parameters, everybody who goes on keto will just be, they'll be sold and they'll stick to it. But you can take a room, and I, I've done this at many, many conferences. Everybody raise your hand if you tried keto. Okay, now, everybody who has s sustained keto for more than, you know, you, you go down the list. Okay, a month, two months, three months. At about the three-month point, the hands just start precipitously dropping down. <laughs> and it, it's a tiny minority of the room who actually prefers and sustains true-to-heart keto uh, indefinitely. So there's something to be said about uh, sustainability. And even if you were to cite, like I did, the satiety superiority of, of a ketogenic diet, only a highly vocal minority of people on Twitter tend to be able to sustain that. Highly vocal. Yeah. <laughs> and it leads you to believing that, oh, well, I, everything that I've seen about keto, I've had people tell me that on social media, everything that I've seen about keto seems really good. It's like, well, you're not, the, it, you're not hearing from the people who are like, after three months, I stopped doing keto. I couldn't keep it up. And that's my post on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram today. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep posting about how keto didn't work for me. No, they're onto something else. Right. But that yep. vocal minority that you talk about, it kind of, right. It, it leads you to believing that maybe it's the answer. Yeah. And maybe you, you are one of those people. So go try it out. Someone ac actually asked me this recently, like, Hey, Ted, do you have a, a, a ketogenic diet template that you could help me with? And I'm like, man, I am not the keto guy. You know, I don't care about ketosis. You know, I've probably been in ketosis, but I didn't measure it because I don't care because it has nothing to do with fat loss. It has everything to do with, right? It has everything to do with energy substrate. Are you using, are you burning fat and ketones? Or are you burning, you know, fat and sugar? Uh, and uh, so it has nothing to do with fat loss at all. Can help with satiety, like you mentioned, can help with epilepsy, which is way beyond what I know about. Uh, and it can help with uh, traumatic brain injuries, I guess. Again, something I don't know much about. But um, but with fat loss, it, the only way it would help is through managing your hunger, like you mentioned, by making you feel full. But then you got to ask yourself, okay, can is this something I can do? Yes or no? For how long can I do this? Because once I go off of it, if I don't understand energy balance, then I'm going to be yo-yoing again. And, it, and that's why so many people end up losing and gaining the same 20 pounds, 10 to 20 pounds over and over and over. Right. And, and, you know, you know, Ted, there's a way to incorporate keto through the week. If you're just going to non-linearize your carbohydrate intake for the purpose of controlling total energy in, and that's fine. I mean, but, but then on the days that you're keto, it's not because there's something special about keto. It's because you are controlling your caloric intake by the end of the week and you want to have some days where there's a substantial carb intake just for uh, hedonistic purposes or social purposes or just purposes of not feeling like you're on linear keto for the rest of your life. And uh, I'm all for that. I, I, I naturally um, eat non-linearly 
You know, I think people can sustain long term through just a nonlinear intake of uh, of the macronutrients, and that and that's perfectly fine. But I, but looking at keto as the objective or as some sort of magical physiological state to sustain, and when you're not in keto, you're not burning body fat. That's absolutely absurd. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, you know, I kind of wanted to get into some of the the psychological stuff. The, the psychosocial aspects of health that people don't appreciate enough and instead, you know, get bogged down into details about, you know, am I, am I doing time restricted feeding? Am I eating too late? And we're not thinking about the, the psychosocial aspects of health like epidemic that we're experiencing, the all the anxiety, all the other stuff. And if you're adding to it with trying to be super strict and you're further disconnecting yourself from others, like I had, I'll, I'll say it like this. I had a client who's gotten really good results being very extreme, hiring some extreme coaches. And now she's in my program and she's doing well. And not only is she doing well, but she's doing it in a way where she doesn't have to be the person who shows up to Thanksgiving with her pre-packaged Tupperware and Ziploc baggy meals that have been perfectly proportioned, perfectly measured. And because what happens people, I mean, we, we can get into fit shaming or fat shaming. I'm against all shame, actually, in case Mm -hmm. you didn't, in case you're listening and you didn't know, but but still, do you want to add that that disconnection and um, you know create? There, I just don't think there's a reason to do that, you know. And I used to be like that, and then I w- I'm so happy to help that person, Bassie out. Shout out to you, Bassie, to make that mental shift to where like, oh, I don't need to do those things. I can st- I can just show up and enjoy the moment with my family, and not have to be like Tupperware in plastic baggy girl. Right. 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 Exactly. And, and there are examples of, um, societies, um, populations that we can look at, we can look at their eating habits and, and we can try to emulate them for, you know, the longevity effects or, or whatnot. And you look, you look at the, the longest living populations on the planet and, and none of them behave diet wise. In, right. in a way that we would assume is required to really kind of maximize our health. You know, there's there's no showing up at the family gathering with your Tupperware because you you have like X amount of macros to go. Um, there's there's nothing particularly extreme, and um, it is possible people do isolate themselves. Um, socially in order to accomplish certain goals. So like, for example, uh, bodybuilding or physique competition. Yeah. I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are either in physique competition themselves or they have uh, a large clientele who, who are competing in physique competitions. So not only do these folks have the physiological stress of the dieting process, but a lot of them just shut out their social lives completely in order to avoid being cornered into eating meals that are not strict to their plan. And so they are harming themselves from a psychological standpoint, in addition to the physiological insult that's involved with pushing the extremes of leanness. And I don't think that enough people talk about physique competition as a sport with a lot of risk. It's a dangerous sport, right? There's rugby where there's the immediate catastrophic impact of just, you know, mechanical forces of two skulls, like banging together. Right. Sure. But with, uh, with bodybuilding, with physique competition, um, uh, in, in all its forms from bikini all the way to bodybuilding, there is the psychological impact, (laughs) the negative psychological impact of, uh, of contest prep. And a lot of this gets perpetuated through the entire year when people do a complex and very precise and and overly gradual, uh, in quotes, reverse dieting process where you get to micromanage your way through the off season 
or most of the off season as well, not just the preseason. You are micromanaging the hell out of yourself all year round. And it's just not healthy from a psychological standpoint. So reverse dieting, you're not a fan because of that. <laughs> it's just another, honestly, I mean, look, there, there are practical benefits to having um, an exit strategy from dieting for four to six months straight. There are practical uh, benefits to having a post-contest meal or even a post, post-contest post week strategy of, of how you are going to graduate up. Um, even like for the lingering for the two weeks after after the post contest period, but when people start planning out your six months of of reverse dieting gradually back into maintenance levels or back into bulking levels, then uh, you know you you get to you get to really sort of see how that can tend to ruin some people, ruin their relationship with food, and while competing. In physique sports is a glamorous thing and while you do learn a lot you learn the values of every single food out there um you learn how your body works how it responds to various macronutrient breakdowns and severities of surpluses and deficits those are all valuable experiences but for a subset of the population who tries that they are just going to be nurturing any number of eating disorders so so something to what something to be careful about. I think that's a really important point too, because a lot of people who are looking to lose body fat, looking to lose weight, and see the cover magazine models, both men and women, see the Instagram people who put up their highlight reels, they don't see that side. They don't see the the psychological struggle these people are going through or the isolation. They see the physique photos that have been purposely shot and purposely chosen to present a certain image because nobody's, I mean, we're, we're in a, I think it's changing a little bit. People are trying to be more open and honest about their own struggles, but you might see that and be like, oh, this person, their life is magical because they're so attractive, right? They get the low body fat, the, you know, all the muscles showing and the truth is that uh, it's kind of extreme, you know, what they've had to do. And their life may not be as amazing <laughs> as you think. And there might be even some disordered, right? Some disordered eating and uh, who knows what else. Right. So, it's, it's, it's a different avenue of risk. This, and this is just the nature of sport. You know, I'm not knocking sport as a as a construct you know physical sport uh, I, gosh you can even look I, I enjoy mma let's face it there's some there's a little bit of risk in oh, MMA, sure. right? a little bit a little bit yeah <laughs> and and now with uh with bare knuckle fighting coming back the uh, bare knuckle fighting championships man these guys get torn up like like pieces of meat it's like wow fascinating right but there's there's a little bit of risk to the bare knuckle championships <laughs> Um, the same level of caution should be taken with, with the risks of um, pushing the extremes of leanness that, that people try to attain with physique competition, especially since they're, they're going to have to deal with a negatively or adversely altered relationship with food just as the result of like even one, one contest prep. You know, you, you carry that with you sometimes for a lifetime. And so these risks have to be laid out uh, at the outset, <laughs> at the outset. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm not knocking the game, right? but as long as people know the risks, then, then you can play the game. Yeah, that's a great point. And I actually just had a bit of an aha moment there myself. Um, I've never had any interest in competing in figure or, or figure. I, I guess it's a uh, physique for men, right? Or, mm -hmm. Definitely not bodybuilding, uh, but I could see how, so I've never experienced it is what I'm saying, but I could see how that could lead to some pretty, you know, like you, like you mentioned some, some issues psychologically, and that may last a lot longer than what you think. Yeah. It's so important, Alan. Well, listen, man, I, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and I'm so glad we kind of dove into some things that 
I think are important to dive into instead of like, okay, Alan, the um, what is the post uh, post workout <laughs> optimal ratio of protein, carbs, and fats? You know, we're talking about real stuff here, and I I don't think enough people are talking about that. They're diving into the science, and I have enough of that on here. But um, and and you are one of the people who. I look to, and, and I consider you a mentor and really appreciate the work you do and the objectivity that you do your best to bring to the science so that we can figure out what really, really works and, and you know, what, what matters here, what, what is really just you know, nitpicking, what really matters here. And, and I really appreciate you for that and want to thank you for that. Um, if there's one big takeaway for the listeners that you'd like them to take away and put back into their lives one mental shift or, or something practical, what, what would it be? What would you tell them? Boy, that, that is, <laughs> Oh man, give Big me a question. second here. Um, I would say that things in the new, in, in the nutritional space, in the, in the diet media, things that are purported to be the new and special thing, whether it's stopping eating at 5 p.m. and you'll live forever or skip breakfast and you'll live forever. If anything sounds a little too special and a little too precious, it's probably not true. So there is a wide version of it doesn't effing matter within the realm of diet. Wide margin of it doesn't effing matter. What does matter is You choose the foods that you personally have a preference for, and you make sure that the majority of the diet is whole and minimally refined, whether you go a little more protein-y and fatty, or whether you go more veggie-y. The the unifying principle of a healthier diet is one that has more whole and minimally refined foods in a minority of the the junk, as it were, regardless of, of, of food sources. And then just maintain favorable body composition and activity levels and try to keep your, your head together and your, your social and spiritual life together. And then, and then, Hey, you've beat the system. So I I know that that wasn't simple at all. So (laughs) that's why when you asked me the question, uh, you know, what's the one thing you'd say? Well, well, let me see if I can add all of this together. (laughs) But I think you did a great job. I mean, you can dive into each one of those, but, but you pretty much summed it up. And don't get too bogged down into one of them because they all matter. And so if you're sacrificing your, if, uh, your, your, your social and spiritual life because uh, of one of the other things, you're spending too much time in the gym, there's a cost to that, right? So you've, and, and if you're spending too much time hanging out with your friends or at church or the temple uh, and not enough on exercise, there's a cost to that too. We all have to find like the right balance for ourselves, what works for us. And so I think that was beautifully stated, man. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Alan, um, you know, it's been too long. We can't let it go this long. I want to hit you back up in, in a few months and we'll, uh, you know, dive into maybe some more physiology uh, or, or some open up some of the things that we talked about today and, and dive a bit deeper. But thank you so much for taking the time and doing this. Um, it's been uh, long overdue, and it, it was just an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you right back, Ted. It really is always a a blast to to get these questions that that I'm not often asked, you know. And and I'm all I'm always up for the bro questions as well. We can maybe dedicate uh, an episode to bro stuff like protein timing, protein amount, and all that that jazz, the sports nutritiony stuff that I grew up learning and stuff, you know, um, and as I get older, yeah, I, I begin to see how, how much less those kind of things matter, but I'm, I'm still a bro. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about and I want to thank you for inviting me on. That wraps up another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. So just an FYI, when we have these longer episodes, I'm going to break them up into two parts because we have seen that a lot of people drop off and we want you to listen to the whole thing because it's so important to get all the details. You let the experts get into your mind and start to shift your thinking. So hope you enjoyed part two. And what I want to tell you is, you know that my 
Legendary Life Program 2020 has just opened. You also know, because I keep telling you, that there's already seven spots gone. And by the time you're listening to this, there are probably even left less. So if you've been listening for a while and you know you want to make a major change and you know it's the time of year to make that happen and if you want to step up and get the amazing results that I've gotten with my own approach as well as all the clients that you've heard on the program, go to legendarylifeprogram.com slash apply to book your free call. You must apply for the program. You can't lick, click a link and buy All right. We don't allow that. You've got to qualify for the program because we've got an awesome group of people in there. We're not going to mess up. It's the VIP party. We're not just going to let anybody in. So you've got to apply. Now, if you're new to the show, totally understand the best way or if you're on the fence, the best way to learn about what I do, my approach and the results, most importantly, right? The results that my clients get. You want to go to legendarylightpodcast.com slash free and watch my free masterclass. There's one for women and there's one for men. So go to legendarylightpodcast.com slash free. All right. That's all I've got. Hope you enjoyed part two. Hope you enjoyed just listening to Alan and his no nonsense approach to nutrition. Have an amazing week and I'll speak to you soon.